Namaste. Good morning, everyone. This is the sixth session that I am recording um, of Shimon Benedi's um, yoga workshop transcript from the yoga workshop entitled The Flow of Life, Where and How Do We Live Our Lives Without Friction, which was given in Cape Town in South Africa 2019. And I want to start by saying thank you, thank you so much to Shimon for his incredible teachings which are so profound and so practical. He really gives us tools to deal with everyday life and applies the yoga wisdom in a way that can make a huge difference in our everyday life. And thank you also so much to Leora Davidis who um, transcribed, sorry, who translated the um, workshop from Hebrew into English. Um, she did a fantastic, incredible job and these words would not be reaching you today without her. Um, the reason that I'm doing these readings is because Shimon is an Israeli teacher who teaches in Hebrew primarily and therefore I think is not very well known in the English speaking world and I really want to um, get his teachings out into the world because I believe that they can help people so much. They have helped me so much in my own life. I've been a student of Shimon's for um, 15 years or more and the shift has been so profound from just following his teachings. Therefore, I really hope, particularly at this time, that these will be practical tools that you can use in your everyday life. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. We'll just start with an om. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bunatu Sahagiyam Karavavahe Tejasvi Madita Matsu Mahavitri Shavahe Om Shanti 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 Namaste everyone. So today's topic was the topic of renewal and we were working with Ajna Chakra, the third eye. The color is indigo or purple and the mantra is Om. Shimon also did a series of pranayama and kundalini chakra um, exercises each day but I'm leaving those for a separate session, as well, of course, as the physical practice that he did of Ashtanga-based yoga <coughs> primary series, um, which can also possibly be, um, the, the comments and teachings there might also be included in those other sessions that I do on Pranayama, uh, which will probably take place next year. And I'm just going to deal with the the two-hour talk that he did, uh, maybe a bit less than that, of renaissance or renewal, which is definitely something I think everybody um, could use right now after 2020, a year of um, profound and subtle change. And so I will just read directly from Shaman's notes. I do sometimes make comments, um, because having transcribed the, the work I did a lot of um, a lot of research into some of the maybe more difficult Sanskrit terms or obscure ones and also more subtle um, points that he's making and maybe I can offer some kind of illumination or not um, I don't mean to obscure them in any way and that's why for the most part it is purely Shimon's words and thank you everyone for listening. So he began the topic of renewal um, with some questions just while he was waiting for people to arrive. And I always include the questions because questions are an important part of the teachings. Uh, other people's questions can really help all of us, as Swami Savapriyananda has always said. It's part of the process of um, questioning. You know, we need to hear the teaching we need to question it and then we need to meditate upon it, to sit with it and marinate in it. So the first question 
um, after having said good afternoon and welcome and thanks for all being here, is um, a question that reflects on relationships with family and friends. How do we learn the discernment of when to embrace and when to walk away? How do we discern? Is Shaman saying that we should avoid the negative and go towards the light, go towards the positive? He is saying that, but at the same time, do we embrace the friction? How do we discern what we should do in any given moment? <clears throat> so Shimon's answer, it's a different kind of knowing, which is very much related to Ajna Chakra. It's not a decision that will depend on information. It will be a knowing that will be a result of how many tools you have developed in aid of being very, very close to your true self. How close are you to your absolute truth? The knowing might differ depending on the tools that you have acquired and the state that you are in. What we are constantly doing every year when he comes back is to try to learn more and develop the tools. The closer you are to your authentic self, you will know this on different levels. What is important is to understand that it's not a knowing that depends on information, that's cerebral. That's um, conceptual of the mind. It's a knowing that comes instead from a place of feeling one with, one with the environment, one with the whole. To simplify, simplify for an example, when there was a tsunami in Sri Lanka, there wasn't one animal that was left there when the tsunami hit. How did the animals know not to be there, to leave? They knew it out of a state of being one with everything because they are on a different frequency. Very often, when we observe our environment, we see it as negative, and we start to go into deep analysis about it, and inwardly about what's not right about the environment. We think the more that we analyze, the more that will give us the tools to know when to move away from it. But actually, that's really deceiving because the more we become resentful towards an environment, the less clear we are in our observation. You will be less in the state of that inner knowing. You will be relying more on information and therefore more reactive based on information. So don't worry yourself about how you will know. You just continue on the path and develop the tools and the knowing will be there. It won't come out of force and it won't come out of a big drama. Like Eckhart Tolle said, water and oil don't mix effortlessly. If there's effort, it means you're being reactive in a situation. In other words, your mind is involved. Does it help? And then any more questions? Um, so there were no questions. Coming back to Ajna Chakra, as we said, through a certain breathing pattern, which he mentioned, we access a certain area with awareness. Then through the visualization of color and through the vibration of sound, we come face to face with the information that is held in that chakra, in that area, that is with the reality, what is there. On the one hand, it helps to balance the chakra. And on the other hand, it might raise your inner resistance. The color, which is related to Ajna, which is situated between the eyebrows is purple. The mantra, which expresses oneness, is Om. So for those who are less familiar with the mantra Om, because I'm sure you're all familiar with the symbol, um, it's a representation of four states, of the four states of consciousness. An awake state, like we are in now, um, and one when we are dreaming, and one that is a dreamless state, deep sleep. Those are the two states, there's two states there. The fourth state is a state of meditation, meaning that we repeat that mantra, that sound. When we repeat that mantra and that sound, we resonate with that frequency of wholeness, oneness. That's the work that we do on a technical basis when we deal with Ajna Chakra. Coming back to Ajna Chakra then, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, I'm repeating that. We usually stay in that area with awareness over a period of time. Keep bringing into consciousness the color and the sound. And then after a few minutes, each one according to how they feel, we do the next step. It's a practical technique. The eyes remain closed, but internally you lift your gaze above the level of the horizon. And we sit in that state with an inner wish. 
In the case of Ajna Chakra, the chakra that represents being one with, you might want to sit with the question, how or what in my everyday activity, maybe in my work, my relationships with my friends, anything that I do daily, how does that contribute to the experience of oneness? Or how can it contribute to the experience of oneness? How does my daily activity and doing contribute to that experience of oneness? You might just have a wish that this experience might happen in your daily life. As you sit with that, it will start to affect your daily doing. It doesn't mean that you change your daily activity or work. You might stay with what you've been doing, but it will change its quality. You might find that with that inner wish, your daily activity starts to contribute and support oneness. So in other words, we have a wish that everything that we do in our daily lives can support oneness. And just having that intention will change the quality of our doing, even if it doesn't radically change, for example, the work that we do. It may do, but it may, it may not do either. The sense related to Ajna Chakra answers the question asked earlier, where do we get insight from? Where do we get wisdom? From our intuition. The sense is intuition because I'm so connected internally that my intuition will tell me. But it's very important to differentiate between intuition and will or desires to differentiate between the two. The more practice and work you do daily, your sadhana, spiritual practice, the more you will cultivate your intuition and that will eventually take over. Trust that the work that you do will strengthen your intuition and don't trust your ability to know if you haven't done the work. Rather, trust that the work will lend to the intuition guiding you. When we say work, we mean all the practical work that we do, the practices that we have been doing, the meditation, the practice of the body, the asana, the reading, the studying of the um, Upanishads and the Vedas and all the spiritual texts, our relationship with our teachers, our relationship with others in our lives. Every moment of our daily life ask, are we in the center of the story or can we remove ourselves from the center? All these processes will bring you closer to the experience of oneness and then you will know, then you can trust your practice, your sadhana. That's the work required for Ajna Chakra. All the questions that are related to separation will start to dissipate and fall away and you will sit with questions about unification. In the scriptures it describes how a student asks his teacher and this is symbolic. What will happen to the creeper when the tree dies and falls? So the teacher responded when you leave here you will meet a human being who has only one eye and he will explain it to you. Meaning that our eyes by definition separate. Our eyes see the creeper and the tree. They separate the two. That's what happens to us here. We see separation. Those kinds of questions arise from seeing separateness. When you feel oneness, those questions fall away. You just know. So it's a matter of perspective. Maybe you just take a plane and you go somewhere else. You do things that are accurate and you won't find yourself so much in dilemma. It's like those animals that knew to go to the mountains before the tsunami, while the human beings were still trying to analyze what the, what the water levels would be and how strong the waves would be and how far they would come up the shore. And at this point, the animals were just not there. While the humans were discussing and analyzing, the tsunami hit them. So you need to trust that your inner work will give you the answers even if sometimes we make a mistake, meaning that we, are follow, that we followed an intuition and got an unexpected result. It just means that your work wasn't in depth enough. So don't doubt the path should that happen. Only know that you might need to do more work. None of us would want things to be amazing without you doing anything to experience that. <clears throat> in other words, without doing the work. We don't want to be blessed with things if we didn't do something to make them happen. 
and this point Leora and other people laughed. I'm asked, I'm asking if he's being facetious, she said, but he says, no, <clears throat> none of us really want to receive to win the lottery, to receive or to win the lottery without any effort whatsoever. We wouldn't wa want that, would we? And there was lots of laughter. And someone said, I would. So Shimon said, but think about it deeply. Think about it deeply. We don't really want to receive amazing things without contributing for that to actually happen. Because that which arrives without us creating a tool to make that happen, it will come and it will go. We haven't, in a sense, created the pathway, created the access that will be there for us permanently if we haven't done the work. It will not become part of our being. Nobody would be happy to live in the elite and wealth of society, for example, in a palace, if it was only given to you for three minutes. It's meaningless then. So things that appear inwards, I would like them to come from me having built the tools to make them happen. That's fundamental. Otherwise, there's no law and order in the universe. There's only chaos. We want to do the work. We want to do the work that brings these things because then we're in, in alignment with the way the universe functions, that there is law and order that we can actually cause things to happen. Um, like we said on the first day, one of the things that a human being is obligated to do is arta. Even though it's not natural to get up and work every day, it's our obligation. Animals don't evolve or develop. As they were born, so they die. It's a straight line. The human beings can either go down be to become demons or they have the option to go towards divinity meaning that we have to work it's part of our obligation or duty as a human being the human being has to develop tools and skills to work to generate an income to have a human being has to work that is why going back to the bible being expelled from the garden of eden is our privilege because that forced us to start creating the tools that will bring us the skills to work and generate an income. That which comes naturally to us doesn't help us evolve and develop. Does anybody disagree? Are there any questions? If you don't understand, maybe what he's trying to say. So there was one question about intuition. Can you trust it only if you've done enough work? And Shaman answered, what does it mean to trust intuition? It means that whatever happens, you accept because you know that it's related to the work that you did. Basically, he's saying that without work, without internal work, sadhana, there is no intuition. It might be will or it might be desire instead. And then the question came, maybe it's just a knowing. And he answered, there's no such thing. And he will explain why. And he asks, are you familiar with the kleshas, the five reasons for suffering in yoga? Kleshas are the natural state of humanity, of the human mechanism, right? How can intuition arise from the kleshas, um, from the ego, in other words? How can intuition come from the ego? And to free yourself from ego, you have to do work. Sometimes what we call a knowing is just our imaginary wishes and desires. We mistake that for, and we mistake that for intuition. So we're just confused. That is not an innate knowing. That usually comes from our wishes or desires because only a human being has intuition. And um, we've talked about before the difference between being born is merely the option to become human. Our first birth is the option to become a human being and that we, by removing the natural mechanism of the ego, by dissolving it, that's how we become human being, which has a singular, has no plural, and uh, refers to the inner truth of what we all actually are. So to be a human being, you need to overcome your klesha your identification with the personal, and that's the sadhana. That's the work that he's talking about, to overcome the ego. 
the ego itself cannot have intuition. Only a human being can have intuition. So all of these people that are doing channeling work, for example, it's not intuition. That is information dependent. Information cannot bring us closer to oneness because it's in the mind. It's a representation. Information, sorry, intuition brings us close to the experience of being one with, which is a reality. Whereas information is just different opinions crossing. So the traditions tell us, if you think that you've done the work and you have arrived, believe that. But if you think you've arrived without doing any work, don't believe that. And then the question, does the work ever stop? And he answered, never ever stops. Never ever, never ending. Why? Because we reside in an environment where everything that occurs is constantly removing the human being from their truth. There isn't a moment in every day life, sorry, that you're not triggered to be removed from your truth. So we seduced in everyday they life back into our egos, back into our thoughts, out of our connection to presence and reality. That is normal. But in every given moment, you can also you can also be supernatural. That is natural to be in the ego state, but in every moment you have the opportunity to be supernatural and to come closer to your truth. It's a choice. He spoke about that when we spoke about freedom. So he'd like to do a short practice of meditation and kundalini. Okay, so I'm going to leave that part and move on to the talk. Right, so the topic for today's talk is renaissance or renewal. For sure, everybody who is here today is going through renaissance because we at least are open to viewing things differently. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. We are open to different perspectives. The basis of renewal is that when we observe ourselves, we are consciously aware that there are not two days that we find ourselves in exactly the same place. If one day we are exactly the same as we were yesterday, we have gone backwards. And he will try to explain this. Meaning that spirit manifests itself, itself in four dimensions. It appears in the tangible, um, the inanimate. It appears in the plant world. And it appears in the anim animal world. And then it appears in this being that speaks. Our place as human beings is slightly different, therefore, meaning that as human beings, we can't function exactly as nature does, because for us, what is natural is something that is actually taking us backwards and away from our truth. The human being, to experience human beingness, has to be in a supernatural state, not what's natural. The Rig Veda says that the spirit found the perfect place in which to reside. That ideal place was the human being, because what makes us different is our ability to speak. The human being is the only being that speaks and has language. Therefore, through our speech, through our bru, bru means words, our bra mean, we become co-creators. Meaning that if we look at our body, the body is in the same realm as the animals. It's constantly renewing itself. Every cell and everything in the body is constantly renewing itself. And our health depends on that renewal process. We're constantly in renewal on a physical level, in other words. And we invest a lot of energy in understanding our nutrition and our emotional states, in understanding how not to disturb our bodies in the process of renewal, and how to have less that will interrupt or obstruct the process of renewal. In our era, it has reached very high levels of awareness. Now there are superfoods and we're very aware of how to support the process, process of renewal by not obstructing it. Um, so, yeah, eating correctly, exercising, doing what the body needs to renew itself. 
we are constantly aware of how to cause as little harm as possible to the physical body in order to keep the body in this process of constant renewal. Because our health physically depends on how much toxicity there is in the body. The more toxicity or dead cells and dead tissue or food that cannot get digested, anything that is toxic, if we are able to remove it, we will remain healthy. We invest a lot of attention and time in that. We try to find out exactly what will be the right nutrition that will cause less toxicity in the body in order to preserve the equation that the more toxicity is, the more we have, we have to remove it. The more we can rebuild what has been damaged and preserve our health. So almost all of us are already living a life consciously aware of that. And we are consciously evolving in our knowledge about how to maintain that. In our body, more than 30 million blood cells die and new ones are produced daily. Even at the age of 70 or 80 or 90, the body's constantly in a process of renewal. The maximum age of the body is basically one year. After a year, everything in the body has renewed itself, every cell. There may be some argument about certain neurons in the brain, but basically every year it's a new body. This is what researchers say. Every year you have a totally new body. But whether we can lead our body into an infinite process of renewal depends on a different dimension entirely. In a natural state, our ability to renew starts to shift at about the age of 40. At the age of 40, people start to go and have all sorts of tests done and things start to work differently. But until more or less the age of 40, nature takes care of the process of renewal. From 40 onwards, however, it's more or less driven by the human being themselves. You see, it's, you see it also in animals. They reach a certain age and then there's a decline in the tissue and the animal goes into decline. So they don't really have the ability to change that once the natural state has um, reached its peak. So naturally our capacity for renewal peaks at a certain level and to go beyond that, beyond the laws of nature in other words, we need to shift into a different dimension. So far, so far are there any questions? There were no questions. So it's an interesting question. If the body is constantly in renewal, and every year it's a new body, then why from a certain age does it not look as good or function as well as it did? Our body and skin doesn't look the same as at 60 as it did when we were 20. And there was some laughter about um, Leora saying, well, I don't know about that. Um, but from a spiritual perspective, Shimon continued, the renewal of the human body, in fact, could be infinite as an idea. There is no reason why the human could not maintain itself. There's no, sorry, the body should not maintain itself. There's no reason why a human being should not keep renewing infinitely. On a spiritual level, because we have this mechanism of renewal and we have the tools as a being of speech to do something with this. So, meaning, in other words, that we don't have a system that stops the renewal, the process of renewal. What differentiates us as a species that speaks or has the capacity for language is that we are able to take this process to the next dimension. That was a question that someone asked, but we don't reach a level where that stops. Spiritually, that process of renewal could go on indefinitely. It's very important to observe that our soul dimension, which is a karmatic entity, is a mechanism that disturbs this infinite process of renewal. We observe that this mechanism that we have holds on to yesterday, holds on to the events of the past, and is not willing to let go of them in order to allow for rebirth, renewal. So the emotional mechanism of the human being is in a very big way responsible for the process of aging. Our emotional state is responsible for our incapacity for indefinite renewal. To be in a state where every moment is a completely new moment with no past is very challenging to our normal mechanism 
and it requires from us all the spiritual work that we keep talking about the pranayama, the asana, the chakra work, the understanding, the wisdom, and practicing it. Meaning that I experience me and everything as part of one mechanism. In order for that experience to manifest from moment to moment, so that I experience it in my consciousness, in my feelings, activities, and doings, I will be required to free myself from the past. So what obstructs renewal is our inner mechanism which keeps holding on to the past. And actually, it could be observed from a different angle that this mechanism itself, which holds on to the past, also has the ability to reflect and to analyze. In other words, it is the same mechanism that can free me from that holding on to. Does that make sense? Yesterday, we said that every hand that became a fist was once an open hand. Remember, open hand or peace. It's the same mechanism that can imprison us and take us down, which can free us. When we talk about the system of being human, he's talking about the system of the kleshas, asmita, avidya, raga, divesha, and abhinivesha. Avidya means ignorance to your truth. We don't know who we are, which is my central question of all spirituality is who am I? You don't know who you truly are, therefore you identify yourself with a persona or an asmita and everything which enhances that persona and you will cling to, rather, and anything that belittles that persona you will push away, devasha. And lastly, you have the strong wish that this persona you identify with will continue of innovation, fear of death as well. That mechanism in its natural state or function never renews itself. Um, that mechanism, sorry, I will never forget that which was done to me. I will never forget that trauma. We always hold on to, that's the natural mechanism. In the system itself, there's no intention, no desire to let go and to recognize that every moment is a completely new moment. But this mechanism itself is the same mechanism that can free me from that state. The tradition tells us that after the human being leaves this world, there are laws of energy preservation, the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us that energy is never lost. Everything goes back to its origins. It in Chandokya Upanishad, the wise man is asked, where does the human being go to? Where does the human being go to after he leaves this world? And the wise man answers, your question itself shows that you understood the spiritual state of the human being. In other words, that the human being is not of the body. He says, hold my hand, and they walk into the forest, which is symbolic. And in the forest, he says to him, the human being is his doings, and they praise karma. Meaning that we can complain about all the imprints that we come with, and we can complain about all our downfalls and our shortcomings, but we forget that moment by moment in our lives, we have the opportunity for rebirth, a renewal. For example, if I have an imprint in myself of getting angry, I will get angry all the time. And so I will get angry at myself because I got angry at my children. So I'm constantly angry. But I forget one thing. The event itself, the, ex the event of experiencing anger was my opportunity to identify that anger. And by identifying that I have that ability, sorry, and by identifying that, I have the ability to free myself from the root cause of anger. And then maybe to let go the pride, the root cause, or the self-importance that I give myself. Or maybe I can free myself from all the expectations that I always have. These are root causes of anger. Meaning that every moment is an opportunity for renewal. I can constantly renew myself moment by moment and infinitely because the presence of spirit is infinite. And how close a human being can come to him or herself is infinite. There is no renewal which is limited, limited in any way. The Upanishad says, if you think you've arrived, 
you are already going backwards. So an important fact to acknowledge is that renewal requires constant work. Sadhana. Trust your sadhana and the sadhana never stops. In that way, you preserve your humility. Regarding this point, is there anything that you didn't understand? You'd like to ask any questions or reflect on this point? And there were no comments. If you have any complaints about anything in your life, is there anyone here who still has some complaints about anything in their life? Maybe it's some laughter. Maybe the body that I received, maybe the events that I've been through, maybe the bad luck I've had in my life. Because from a spiritual perspective, whatever you've experienced is very accurate. It's what you need to experience. Whatever you experience is accurate for your journey. Question. Shimon, can you say something about fear blocking renewal? And Shimon asks, on a physiological level, fear paralyzes the whole mechanism or system of renewal of cells, especially in the digestive area. It really paralyzes your system. It makes you lose the present moment and renewal can only happen in the present moment. Not yesterday and not tomorrow. I have to be present, but fear always removes you from the present moment. Now, on a soul level, fear, and it might sound strange to say this, fear is a mistake or an error. Yet, we say we experience fear. That's what we're experiencing. So what does it mean to say it's a mistake? The idea is that we're not fearing this moment. We fear what will happen in the future. Uh, maybe a second from now, or a minute from now, or a week from now. We're not fearful of this very moment. So fear is a mistake from the perspective that it removes presence. It's a logical error in a way. It takes the present away from you, and it doesn't bring anything in return. It's just something related to the future, which is an illusion. It's important to acknowledge it, because when we begin to differentiate what fear is, we develop a different relationship to fear. It calls us less and on a different level of intensity. Fear on a spiritual level is not a fear of what is happening now in this moment. The fear is actually from what we carry inside us in relation to the world around us. I would like to just intervene here, something that Leora always taught us, and Shimon has said it too, that in the present moment, if you find yourself in a life or death threatening situation, there is often no fear, and people will report this, that at that moment they weren't thinking. Therefore, there was no fear. They simply did what needed to be done. You, you simply act. So the fear comes from the mind. So the fear might come in after an event, or before, of course, but in the moment, it actually it doesn't exist. So the fear is actually from what we carry inside us in relation to the world around us. So we can say that we are fearful, for example, because of the events that are happening in the environment in which we live. But actually, your fear just dresses itself up. It takes the events that are happening and uses it in its favor as an excuse in a way. Deep, deep internally, from a spiritual perspective, fear is an indication of our relationship with the world around us. And that is where we need to create a shift. For example, we find ourselves very judgmental towards beings and situations. But in true reality, we are actually one with everything. So if we experience judgment deep, deep inside in our subconscious, we feel that it's not right. So in our subconscious, we feel that we are doing something that is not right. And so we become fearful. And that's that something bad will happen to us. That is the true origin of fear. So fear does not come from an event, but rather from the way that I relate to life and this world around me, the way I see it. Do I judge it or do I feel one with it? The more you feel one with, the less there will be fear in your life. 
If I change my relationship with life, I won't experience fear. If there is an event and something happens, whatever happens will happen and I will act. Maybe I will remove myself from there. Maybe I will stay and defend. There might be an action, but I won't experience fear. Or maybe if my financial relationship changes, I might shift things. I will always take some kind of action. But the fear that often goes along with the action is related to something far deeper inside you regarding the way you relate to the world around you, how you see the world. Do you judge it or do you deal one with it? There is a description in a book called Red Earth Pouring Rain by Vikram Chandra of a meeting between Alexander the Great and a Zen yogi. Alexander the Great, as you might know, didn't use conventional measures. He wasn't exactly gentle, kind and compassionate. He was a little bit of a tense human being and used some rather extreme measures. So when he meets this yogi, he's very surprised that the yogi is not afraid of him. And he doesn't understand how anyone cannot be afraid of him. But then he discovers through this meeting that there are other aspects to fear. That's it. Any more questions? Um, I'll just add as part of my research into this the, foot, the footnote. So um, if you don't judge people in the world around you because you feel one with them, and therefore you look at them with compassion and love, and love then you will never have the experience of fear because fear arises from judgment when internally or subconsciously we know it is wrong to judge other who is really ourselves. That knowledge causes a feeling that something bad will happen as a result. So sorry, this is going back to the explanation of fear. So in Bikram Chandra's The Red Earth Pouring Rain, um, it refers to a story that Alexander the Great was incensed when he encountered a yogi who showed no fear at him despite Alexander's terrible reputation. The story goes that Alexander demanded to know why the yogi wasn't afraid of him, and the yogi replied, why should I be afraid of you? So Alexander threatened him, because I'm going to kill you. But the yogi just replied impassively, okay, go ahead and kill me. Alexander was amazed and asked, but why aren't you afraid? You should be terrified, I'm going to do all sorts of terrible things to you, and you're going to die. To which the yogi then just turned to Alexandra's soldiers and asked, what's wrong with him? Is he constipated? And the story then continues that after this, Alexander actually stopped harassing the yogi because he realized that if the yogi wasn't afraid of him or afraid of dying, that he, Alexander, had no power over him. And the yogi actually held a greater power than he, the great conqueror, ever possessed. And so he decided instead to sit at the yogi's feet and learn from him. The yogi thus demonstrated that fear is not about the events in our lives because he was connected to his true internal, eternal nature and therefore he had no fear of death and therefore no fear of Alexander. According to Shaman's explanation, this means that the yogi did not judge Alexander as, as a bad person because he understood he was one with him and therefore fear did not arise because he had not done anything against his own true nature and therefore had no subconscious reason to fear something bad. Hence, he was not afraid of Alexander hurting him either because he also understood that whatever happened would happen only to his physical body and not to his true self. So that's just talking around a little bit more. Hopefully that helps a little bit as well. Um, So then there was a question, how or what tools do we need to connect to people, to humanity for renewal? When you focus on yourself as renewal, and you, but you look around, so you can focus on yourself in renewal, but if you look around you and everything that's happening, you know, in our country and around the world, what do you do? You start with yourself first. What tools do you need to create that oneness and that renewal. And Shaman answered, first he thinks that there are so many daily situations that awaken in us justification for judgment. And to overcome that is a great tool. If my hand hurts the other hand accidentally, if this hand hurts that hand accidentally, um, this hand won't come and hurt that hand back, right? 
because it's part of one unit. To observe that and to try and apply it. That's part of the practice of yoga. I don't need to learn to do headstands in order to practice this. I need to practice not being judgmental in everyday life. For example, I will start to contemplate how my doing in whichever field I work can support as many other beings as possible. In other words, move away from self-gain and self-interest. In my doing, have the intention of not harming any other being. That kind of approach and that kind of doing requires for me to overcome my natural system, which each one of us has and which only sees self. This kind of work takes me out of that conventional realm. Then from that practice, you begin to gain insights and realizations. It is possible that a business person whose doings come from an experience of oneness could be more influential than any yoga or spiritual teacher on this planet. Because anything that you do, it comes from that perspective, from seeing the world at one, as one. And it requires overcoming your natural system, which is driven by self-gain and, and self-gain. Suddenly, you begin to realize how you are one with everything, with everyone. And from that realization, more and more insights begin to come your way. Does that help? Any other questions? No questions. So touching on another dimension for a moment regarding renewal. Any doing or activity that we find ourselves involved in always comes from a certain perspective or understanding. Um, for example, if I start to study mathematics, I'm event I'll eventually get to a certain level of understanding and from there I usually decline. Or, for example, if I'm in a personal relationship, I will have a certain understanding about this relationship. So the relationship will reach a certain level and then it will start to decline, maybe a certain expectation. The decline is inevitable. Do you understand that? Do you understand why? Because understanding is already limited. So whatever understanding or concept we have about something, that will limit it. I have a certain understanding and that creates a limitation. It's as if you fill a bowl and when the bowl is full, it starts to overflow. At a certain point, which is the limit of your understanding, you won't experience renewal anymore. And usually you'll experience the beginning of a decline. At this point, most people begin to develop doubts because that's how the mind works. Naturally, I think maybe, so I think maybe I'm in the wrong relationship, or maybe I've made a mistake with my choice, or maybe the job that I chose for my career is not exactly the right job for me. Very often, as that decline begins, all sorts of doubts start to come up, and these have nothing to do with the journey itself. What does it have to do with it? Do with? It has to do with, for example, how much I understand about this relationship or this job. Therefore, as soon as the decline begins, that is the moment of opportunity to expand the understanding, to learn more about the subject and to start widening or broadening my understanding of it. If it was mathematics, for example, maybe I could start to learn about more complex equations or something like that. But the important thing is to go deeper in my understanding of the subject. Then you will experience from the decline that you start going up again meaning that when my understanding has reached its limit, I will experience a decline. And in my natural state, I will develop doubts. But on a spiritual level, as a human being, that decline is an indication that this is where I have to start broadening my understanding. And then I will start to reach new heights. And this process will continue, never ending. Always, I will get to a certain level of understanding and then I will start to decline and therefore renewal is required. So to take another example on the topic of renewal, when we suddenly feel the body's responding badly to something, the less good thing to do is to run to a doctor because medicine is usually dealing with the dead, not with the living. It can't really say much about the living entity. It's all about dealing with the dead. So it just starts to follow statistics. But if we accept spiritual laws, we are aware that anything that happens with the body 
is just coming to awaken us to a new level of understanding, to a new dimension. We'll take that physical experience or event as an opportunity to better our health conditions, meaning the decline of our health is an opportunity for you to enhance your health. Does that make sense? When we start to feel we're stagnated emotionally or in our relationships, we know that this is the opportunity to build more effective tools to try and understand better. For example, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What is parenting? We try to deepen our understanding and use these tools. He actually, what he said there, according to Leila, to your translation, is what does it mean to be male and what does it mean to be female? Because maybe there is a difference culturally between being male and being a man and being female and being a woman. So I just want to um, make sure I'm um, stating that correctly. We try to deepen our understanding and use these tools or insights so that we will then experience renewal and the renewal will take us to higher levels. Even if it's to do with our creativity, for example, in your art as an artist, if your creativity stagnates or maybe your work never sells, that's only an indication that renewal is required. Try to build the tools that will give you a broader understanding so that you can renew because the one thing that I know very deeply is that the human journey is infinite I know that all the time I just have to build the tools to receive more light and then I will fill the container and then I'll have to build a bigger container to receive more light it's like a journey into infinity it always reaches a certain limit it declines a bit and then you develop a better understanding and then it rises again. So the process of renewal requires observation inward, spiritual perspective, and then it rises again. Um, sorry. Turn the attention inward and build new tools, in other words. Does anyone have any questions about this journey? Is anyone experiencing stagnation or decline, whether it's financial, um, situation or relationship related maybe you'd like to ask some questions about renewal in those areas question maybe what type of questions you could ask yourself to know where you are in that process answer first of all and maybe we don't want to ask this question am i identical today as i was yesterday then i'm already on a decline on all levels do i daily do exactly the same activity Prepare the same meal. If everything is the same, I'm already in decline. That's already, that already puts us all in a state of discomfort. Another thing that might help us to realize when we're in stagnation or decline is our immediate reaction to every event. If I hear about a certain event and I immediately feel compassion and love and kindness to anyone who was involved, I'm probably on the incline. If immediately I experience judgment, fear, blame, pointing fingers and such, most likely I'm on a decline. So our indication in everyday life are usually quite obvious. What we need to do, as he said on the day that he spoke about spiritual perspective, what, we, what will help us always is to take yourself out of the center of the story. So in other words, how can my action benefit everyone, not just me? What does the picture look like when I'm not at the center of the story? Immediately you will start to see things differently. Always allow yourself to approach everything from a slightly different angle, a wider perspective. Even your nutrition, your meals, your daily habitual conduct, always find something new. If you find that, you're always, that you always have discussions that are repetitive, nothing should feel the same, same and same. The human being is a microcosm of the macrocosm and the Rig Veda tells us that the human being is now also what will become of human beings. One of the tools that might help us in this case is to ask each one of us here the question, how do you see yourself a year from now? Often 
it's very difficult to see a picture like that. And if the picture is identical to today's picture, then you're on the decline. It can't be that in a year from now it will be identical. Same food, same routine, same, same, same. The universe is constantly in flux. And if the body is constantly renewing, why should we stagnate and stay the same? How close can we get to the infinite? Infinitely close. It just requires courage. Not courage to express my opinion, but courage to live life in constant shift, flux, change. The ancient Greek tradition and the yogic tradition always said you cannot enter the same river twice. Do you know that saying? You can't even enter the same river once because the river is, is constantly changing. And also, I'm constantly changing. I'm not the same human being now who I was this morning or when I woke up or even a moment ago. I'm a different being moment by moment. I'm a different being and that is important to recognize. And what supports us, even though we know it's very difficult, is to realize my past, sorry, to release my past from dictating my present. Let go of the past or the dead so that they don't continue to dictate our lives. What we need is rebirth at every moment. Is there something that you wanted to ask? My question came, yes, on the topic of infinite renewal. Spiritual teachers would say that consciousness is constantly expanding and a lot of people in this day and age would say, how can that be possible? I think for myself, I feel like consciousness is expanding, but I don't know if that's because of what I'm experiencing. Do you believe that consciousness is constantly expanding at the moment? And Shaman answered, it is said that it is not an evolutionary process, but it is a discovery process. Meaning that who we are, we are everything, but we came limited or we came concealed. Meaning that our soul, which is the karma, conceals from us that infinite consciousness. And naturally, we won't remove those blinds that conceal this from ourselves. Removing that which conceals is our duty, our obligation. It's what we have to do. That is the purpose of our existence. I was born in order to remove those skins of the fruit. It's not that I was born a small monkey and now I will transform into a larger ape. But I am God, concealed, hidden. And my process is a discovery of that. Not that it grows. It's just that you come back to experience its vastness, its infiniteness, through removing the skin. Does that make sense? Every time that I overcome my reactivity, I've removed a certain layer. And I feel a little bit closer to my true self. So my consciousness feels like it's expanded. But it's more about discovery. It's a process of discovery. One way that we might experience this in daily life, as Ramakrishna says, is to look at the earth. The earth is constantly giving. Try to learn from the earth. As much as we tread on it and poison it, it's always in a state of giving. I try to learn from space. Space is everywhere. It is everywhere and yet it's not influenced by anything. Then I find in life that regardless of the situations that occur, they don't affect or contract my heart. They don't diminish my love. I always stay clean and open to love unconditionally. And so if we look at this, there's this constant process that occurs as I overcome my natural habit, habitual pattern and reveal that which I truly am. When I find myself in a state of judgment, I will feel that I'm never happy in that state. I will realize that I'm never happy in a state of judgment. Even if you think you're right, you never actually experience happiness in that state of judgment. It's a state of hell. It's it's a state of unease and discomfort inside. Notice that. Observe that in yourself. But if you're in a state of compassion or giving or supporting, on the contrary, you will always feel this inner joy or happiness because you resemble them and you become, and you become close to your truth, to life itself. You resemble life. 
and resemble Mother Earth, like Mother Earth. Another sutra in the Yoga Sutras tells us that the system didn't create the wholeness of who we are. The mechanism that we are born with is there in order to remove that which obstructs the wholeness of who we are. Meaning the mechanism is there to help us shed that which conceals who we are. Does that make sense? Answer, yes. I guess what I was reading it as is gross consciousness as a capital C of the whole and thinking if consciousness is expanding ultimately we're all going to grow in consciousness to the point that we have this ultimate harmony in the world but maybe that's a function of the mind wanting that achievement and I think there was a little bit of a misunderstanding in terms of um, terminology here I think the question was the way consciousness is used colloquially today when they say consciousness is expanding, um, I think what they mean is that more and more people are waking up. And that's maybe what um, what he was actually trying to say, rather than that consciousness itself is expanding. Vishimon is saying consciousness itself is infinite already. It can, can't expand anymore. It is already infinite. It is simply that it is concealed from us by the natural mechanism. And that's through a dis process of discovery of removing the veils, we discover who we truly are and the infinite consciousness. So it was, I just think, a little bit of a confusion in the question and the answer here. But Shimon went on to, to emphasize this again. He said, yes, I, um, Leora, sorry, Leora then said, maybe, maybe, but you understand what he means that consciousness is not growing, but our realization might give us that kind of feeling that it's growing. As we shed our skins, it's like consciousness is growing, but it's actually always infinite. We are just limited, and then we slowly reveal more and more as we shed our skins. And the reply was, I think so. I might have to sleep on it and come back tomorrow. Yes, sleep on it and come back tomorrow morning. We can discuss it more. So then we will just come back into a meditative state for a moment or two. So observing, and we can do this now, observing our physical body inward, realizing that that which lends to the continuation of this physical body is in constant renewal. Maybe just close your eyes for a moment. Always eliminating that which no longer serves, cleansing all toxins on a physical level, on a mental level. Always renewing and rebuilding. Be grateful for that function deep internally and allow on a soul level deep within that our emotional health will come from the same source of renewal so that we can let go even if it's in a sleep state all that which we tend to cling and hold on to and we will realize that every single moment of our day is an opportunity to release and let go of that which we hold on to and that renewal is that which lends to my health and my happiness, to my constant renewal. And daily in my spiritual practice, I will keep building my tools and creating bigger and stronger tools, allowing more light and more happiness to enter my life daily. So bringing your hands to the heart center, we would like to thank each and every one of you for being present. Namaste. Thank you very much. So the next session is Shimon's, which was Shimon's last day, where he was going to be presenting the topic of unconditional love. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Um, if I manage to get the comments working, then I'm very, very willing to enter into any um, discussions about any of these talks. Namaste. Thank you. Om Shanti 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 Thank you to Shimon, thank you to Leora.